Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So glad that you are here. If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to, to page uh, to Luke 19, verse 28 through 40. It's been a couple weeks since I've been up here, so I feel like I'm stumbling my way through this. Uh, today we are launching our sermon series for Easter. Now, it might surprise you that we're launching our sermon series for Easter, but that's what we're doing. So, surprise. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke for all of 2022, but today we're looking at the later chapters of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're going to be focused for the next several weeks on the events leading up to the crucifixion, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. And I'm so glad that our Parker campus is joining us today. We are excited about what God is doing as God is growing your community, working through you to reach the community it's so amazing, and we're glad that you are there with us. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to grab one of the Bibles under the seats in front of you and turn to page 1044. And for our Parker campus, you can jump up, grab a table in the back of the room, grab a cup of coffee and a cookie while you're there, and come on back for worship. And if you're joining us through our podcast or if you're watching us online later in the week, you can download the YouVersion Bible app and you'll find all of our life notes right there inside the app and you can follow along with our sermon. And as always, if you don't have a Bible at your house that you could read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. If you have a friend that doesn't have a Bible, take one of our Bibles home with you and give it to them. Uh, we firmly believe that if we read and apply God's Word, He will transform our lives. Well, have you noticed that it is springtime? Here in Havasu, and I'm sure in Parker as well, the spring breakers are here. They are everywhere you go, from grocery stores to the traffic to the light at Mulberry. They are everywhere. Uh, that also means, since spring is in the air, that softball season has arrived for the Donahue House. Now, last year, only one of our girls played softball, and we could manage it. This year, we have three of our four girls playing softball, and it is crazy. I, I'm going to talk to my wife about our scheduling. Uh, last year, I was able to help coach my daughter's team, but this year, we have three separate practices in two different locations. And on game day, sometimes we have three games happening in two separate locations. It is madness. I feel like I'm walking back and forth, as my grandmother used to say, like a chicken with my head cut off. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a chicken with its head cut off. Yes, I'm not exaggerating. That is exactly how I feel. Now, when it comes to softball and when it comes to their at-bat, I love watching a kid walk up to the batter's box, hold that bat in their hands, and stare down at the pitcher. There's something really cool about all the attention of the park, or at least all the attention of the bleachers, all of a sudden focus in on the contest between the pitcher and the batter. Now, it's a little nerve-wracking for some kids, but it's neat to see them as they develop courage and stand there and get hit in the foot by the pitch. <laughs> now, when I was the girl's age, I played Little League and T-ball, and whenever a good batter went up to the batter's box to hit, the coach would tell his team, hey, back up a little bit. And if they were a great batter, the coach would say, hey, back up to the fence. That never happened when I stepped to the plate. I, I'm nearsighted. I wore glasses. My parents wouldn't, be, wouldn't let me play so or baseball with my glasses on. And so I'd stand up at the plate having no idea when the pitcher threw the ball, if the pitcher threw the ball. I didn't know if the pitcher was waving at his family. I didn't know if he was throwing the ball. So I'd just stand there and I'd swing randomly. I think he threw the ball, so I swing the bat. It was terrible. 
It was awful. Now, I made up for it years later when I got into college and was able to uh, play intramurals. And all of a sudden, I'm playing with my glasses because my mom couldn't stop me. And I'm swinging and I'm connecting with the ball. And I love to watch how people responded. It's interesting how people respond to our presence. When people respond to us, oftentimes they're responding to us in a way as we interact with them to say, I know something about you. People have an internal response whenever they see you and I today. When you see somebody coming, you have an internal response. Uh, when you enter your home or when you enter a room or when you arrive at work or when you walk into your office, people react and they respond to you based on what they know about you. And, and I know that for sure because you and I do the very same thing. When we see people coming, we develop a response or reaction as we see them. When you see an old friend, you wanna grab them and you wanna give them a hug and you wanna embrace them because of what you know about them. When you see a friend that you work with, you don't necessarily greet them the same way. Uh, when you see somebody you don't like, you might avoid eye contact with them altogether. And it's remarkable to see how people in Jesus' day responded to him when he entered into Jerusalem. Jesus had been changing lives. He'd been working miracles. He'd been talking about forgiveness. He'd been talking about hope and second chances. For three years, he had been leading this rebel rousing crowd and telling them about God's forgiveness and about second chances and explaining how people could reconnect with God. And after three years, he had ticked off a lot of the religious leaders. They weren't happy with what Jesus was teaching. He got under their skin. He ruffled their feathers because the core of Jesus' teaching was on faith, uh, forgiveness for our sins through faith in God. And the core of the religious leaders was really forgiveness through good works, that man had to do good things in order to please God. And Jesus was teaching about forgiveness and grace. And so the religious leaders had had enough of Jesus. And in John eleven fifty seven, right before Jesus had entered, in Jerusalem, entered into Jerusalem, the, uh, the religious leaders made a public declaration that if anybody saw Jesus, they were to turn him in. In John eleven fifty seven, the gospel writer writes, meanwhile, the leading priests and the Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must, uh, must report it immediately so they could arrest him. They had placed the highest level of a Jewish warrant on Jesus. And they made it known to every Jewish person that if they did see Jesus, they were supposed to turn him in. Remember, snitches get stitches. And Jesus responded to this warrant that they had issued for his arrest by walking directly into the heart of the playground of the Jewish leaders. He went right into Jerusalem after they had made this warrant or taken this, uh, made this public declaration. In fact, this was the only time in all of Jesus' ministry that he made himself the center of attention. We're going to begin reading in Luke chapter 19 at verse 28. Jesus had just finished teaching, and in verse 28, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You will say this, the Lord has need of it. 
So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the ground, on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, I, I love this passage of scripture in the way that the disciples, the followers of Jesus, honored and lifted up Jesus. Now, they didn't know that Jesus within a week would be betrayed, that they didn't know that he would be beaten and humiliated and paraded through the town carrying a cross. They did not know that Jesus was going to suffer, that he was going to die, and that he was going to pay the price for their sins in just a few days. All they knew was that Jesus wanted to enter into Jerusalem on a colt or on a donkey, and they made it happen. They took a donkey. That's what they did, by the way. They took it. They took a donkey. They put their cloaks on it for Jesus to sit on. They spread more cloaks on the ground, and they called Jesus king. They didn't treat him like a king because he had told them to. Jesus didn't instruct them to treat him like royalty, but they did treat him like a king because for three years, Jesus had treated each one of them like they were a king, like they had value, like they were important. He spent time for three years with tax collectors, with people that nobody wanted anything else to do with. He encouraged the, the women who had given themselves into prostitution. He spent time with notorious sinners and with beggars and lepers and with the outcasts of society. And just by Jesus spending time with them and encouraging them, man, those people believed that they could do just about anything. They felt valued. They felt heard. They felt important. And now as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, his followers took an opportunity to treat Jesus the very same way that he had treated them. They treated him like royalty. Now it's important to note that during this time, whenever a neighboring king would enter into a city, if it was during a time of war, that king would ride in on a horse, on a steed, on a, on a stallion, whatever, on a big old horse. And he would let, by doing so, he was letting the world know or the community know that he's going to conquer it. He's going to seize control of it and he's going to exercise dominion over the people. But in times of peace, whenever a king would enter a village, he would ride into that village or town or city on a colt or on a donkey. It symbolized peace because the donkey was considered a, a loyal, humble, lowly animal. And in case there were any rumors that the king was going to come or the armies of another, of another nation were going to invade them, the king would ride into that city to put those fears to rest. He was saying, I'm coming in peace by hopping on a donkey. So I want you to understand something. This symbolizes for you and I today that Jesus isn't against you. He's not out to conquer you. He's not out to defeat you and to humiliate you. Jesus loves you and he wants to enter into your town, enter into your heart and bring you peace with God. He wants you to know that he loves you, that he cares for you. 
The entrance that Jesus made stands out to me as one of the most courageous events in history. And I don't say that lightly. I think about Tank Man in Tiananmen Square that stood in front of the tanks as they were invading uh, uh, Tiananmen Square, that college student, as he stood and that backed up that whole line of tanks. That was courageous. Uh, I think about the Marine uh, Memorial where the Marines are holding up the American flag at the Battle of Iwo Jima, and that's memorialized there as a statue, as a memorial, the courage that they demonstrated. I think about the men and women that rushed into the World Trade Center demonstrating courage to rescue people that they didn't know or friends and family that they were inside. When I think about courage, I think about those events, but I also think about this moment when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It was courageous. Jesus knew what he was going to face. He knew that there was an arrest warrant out for him. He knew he was going to be crucified and give up his life for you and I. When Jesus entered, he demonstrated courage and defiance toward religious bullies. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he demonstrated courage and defiance toward religious bullies. See, Jesus knew one of his followers was going to betray him. He knew there was an arrest warrant out for him. I love how he responded. He didn't slip into Jerusalem overnight when it got dark. He didn't sneak into the city. He didn't hide in a cart filled with supplies and get pushed in. Jesus confidently entered Jerusalem with the highest visibility possible. It was almost as if he was saying, hey, here I am. I am not hiding from you. I'm going to fulfill my purpose. He rode into Jerusalem like royalty. Crowds of people were gathered around him. If there had been paparazzi, the paparazzi would have been right there. Other gospel writers tell us that the, the people in the crowd, crowd were waving palm branches and shouting out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now the religious bullies had a problem. That people liked, the religious leaders liked to control people. They liked to control the crowd. And now they had a hero of the people to contend with. The people were celebrating the champion who had celebrated them. They cheered for the one who had cheered them on. They socially elevated the status of Jesus because Jesus had elevated their status. When he spoke with women, when he healed the lepers, when he took care of the blind, Jesus elevated their status socially and his followers took a moment to elevate his status and treat him like royalty. They blessed the one who blessed them. They brought words of peace to the one who had brought peace to them. So for you and I, as we think about application from this passage of scripture, none of us is going to enter into Parker or Lake Havasu City with crowds of people gathering around us shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So as we think about application, what I want you to think about is your relationships with other people. I want to encourage you like Jesus, bring and leave peace. Bring and leave peace. Do you bring peace to others when you enter into a room? Do you leave peace when you exit the room? See, we all have the ability to bring comfort and to bring peace and to bring encouragement to those around us. We can use our words to help others or we can use our words to hinder others. My question for you is this, and I'm gonna ask a bunch of questions. Are you a peace bringer? Or do you leave a room in conflict? Do you make people feel better and live better 
and live closer to God because of words of encouragement that you speak? Or do you just enhance conflict with words of division? Do you constantly disagree with people because your opinion is the only right opinion? See, these questions are difficult for all of us as we think about them. As a parent, sometimes when I jump into conflict between my daughters at the house, I feel like I'm making things worse because I'm either going to take one person's side or I'm not. It's hard to settle a conflict in a way that honors both individuals that think they're right and both individuals that, that had their feelings hurt. I, instead of making things better at times, sometimes I feel like I make things worse. So more questions for you. And, and I really want you to reflect and I want you to let the answers kind of linger around in your mind for a little bit. If you're married and your spouse sees you, do they brace themselves for conflict or are they relaxed and relieved when they see you coming? If you're a child, when your brother or sister see you coming, do they hold their breath? Do they wait for the insults to begin or do they light up because they know you guys are gonna play together and you're gonna have fun? Employers, if you are in charge of hiring people and leading people, do you rule with an iron fist? Or are people motivated to work hard for you because you work hard for them? Parents, do you constantly criticize or, or overwhelm your children with their failures? Or are you searching for areas to encourage them? And are you building them up in a healthy, biblical way that helps them really fully understand who they are in Jesus? The reason why I ask those questions and they do make us a little bit uncomfortable as we think about how people respond because we don't fully know how people respond. It's because people respond to presence based on patterns. People respond to presence based on patterns. Now, as people lined up that day to celebrate Jesus, as they lined up and they were worshiping him and celebrating him and waving those, those palm branches, Verse 37 tells us that the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. See, people were responding to Jesus' presence based on the pattern of his lifestyle. They were responding to his presence based on all the good works that they had already seen. Trust me, if Jesus was selfish, and self-centered and rude and always had to have his way, people would not have been gathering there around him. Jesus didn't pay people to follow him. Jesus didn't pay people to worship him. People were responding to Jesus that day based on the pattern that Jesus had been living out. He wasn't demanding, he wasn't rude, he wasn't selfish. So how do you and I establish a pattern that brings peace to other people? Well, it's only going to happen if you and I choose joy because of Jesus. It's only gonna happen if we choose joy because of Jesus. See, what we have to do, if you're a follower of Jesus, the only way you're going to experience this type of contagious celebration that these individuals had is when you remember the pattern of Jesus at work in your life. You have to remember what Jesus set you free from. You have to remember what your old life was like, how bad a person you were, how messed up your life was, without Jesus. And when you can remember that, then you remember what he has been doing in your life since then. 
He didn't just set you free from sin. He gave you a whole brand new heart. He changed your heart. He changed your thoughts. He changed your emotions. He gave you new friends. Jesus completely revolutionized your life. He forgave you. You have peace with God. You can go to God day or night, anytime, and call out to him because of what he has done, not through what you have done. See, we respond to Jesus based on what he has done to our, in our lives, and it does create joy. You and I cannot create joy. You and I cannot manufacture joy. We are still in our flesh. It's impossible for you and I to create joy. But as we remember the works that he has done in our lives, it presses us closer to God. And as we press closer to God, we want to pour our heart out to him. As we press closer to God, we want to pray. We want to call out to him. We want to spend time in his presence. And when you and I pray, and when we spend time in God's presence, God supplies us with joy that is from his very essence of who he is. He gives us this incredible joy because God is a joy-filled God. You ever think about that? See, if God was responding to you and I based on our sinfulness, well, because God is just, he would be responding to everybody that way. And if our sin made God sad, we would have one big sad God up in the sky. I mean, constantly disappointed with his followers, right? Because you and I know our hearts. And as we spend time in God's presence, God is giving us that joy that is part of who he is. It's part of his essence. That's why you can always tell when people aren't spending time with God. When people claim to be followers of Jesus, like the religious leaders, right? Or the, would they claim to be followers of God and know God, and they're all grumpy and sad and mean. But when you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus meaning that you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you've trusted that what he did for, for you on the cross was to forgive you, to pay the price for your sin, and you committed your life to him, you experience joy when you're in God's presence because God is giving it to you. And as we pray, and as I close this message, as I was processing through what it means for us to be peace bringers, I remembered a prayer that I learned through song and by memorization when I was a child growing up in Catholic school. And I thought it would be appropriate to close out the message with the words of this prayer. In your life notes, let me invite you to write down these words, the prayer of St. Francis. And I want you to take a look at it a little bit later on today. I'm going to say the words, but I want you to look at the words and think, man, is this something I could actually incorporate into my prayer life? These are the words. Now, St. Francis is not attributed with writing this. It's just called the prayer of St. Francis. These are the words. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace where there is hatred let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek, so much to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love others. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I mean, if, if those were the words that you and I could begin to apply to our lives, when people see us coming, they would know that we're bringing peace, not destruction, not conflict, not our own opinion. They would know that we're bringing peace.
because we're loving others and we pu we're putting ourselves in last place in every relationship that we have. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these words. Thank you for scripture. Jesus, thank you for this example as you defied religious bullies and you brought peace that even through the violent death on the cross, you brought peace. Remind us of that as our world walks through conflict. Remind us of that as we go through conflict in our homes, in our relationships. Help us to be peace bringers, not conquerors. Help us to love others and not necessarily seek to be loved. Help us to put ourselves in last place in every relationship that we have and put you at the forefront. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.